I put together a roadmap of everything you need to learn to become a full stack data scientist in 2023. It's pretty easy to follow the roadmap, although it's going to be hard to learn all these topics. There are a lot of topics if you want to learn absolutely everything, and I don't expect anyone to actually learn the whole thing. It makes full stack data scientists very rare because it's so easy to specialize into different sets of data science. Things like data engineering, data analytics, or machine learning are the different ways that you can specialize. And I talk about all three, and also you could just learn all three if you want to become an absolute beast. On my website, I made a little graphic for this roadmap. Here's the URL. I made a giant mouse just so you can see where my mouse is. But I'll add this URL to the description. Is also put it right here if you want to type that into your URL bar. But finish watching this video first. So say you're here, you know absolutely nothing. You got to start with the basic math, Python, and these other things. Then you'll have mastered the fundamentals, and you can choose your own adventure here. Go into data engineering, go into data analytics, go into machine learning. There is isn't is some overlap, but not a ton. You could get away with specializing in just one and being vaguely familiar with the others. But all these these three port directly into the deployment world. How do you communicate these things that you've made and found? And then eventually you become a real world expert once you've done enough real world projects. So scroll down past all the blah, 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 down into the fundamentals. So we got math first. Math is especially important for data science, but I would say if you're in the subset of machine learning, it is imperative that you learn linear algebra and calculus. Machine learning, neural networks, artificial intelligence, it's, it's no more than applied linear algebra and applied calculus. So become really good at these, and that'll give you a great foundation for machine learning. But regardless of how you want to specialize, probability and, st and statistics are going to be incredibly important. It's when you make conclusions about things or claims about different things, how can you be certain that those are the truth? How can, you be know, how can you know that it's correlation or change or causality? Probability and statistics allows you to be confident with those statements. Okay, moving forward, basic Python. There are so many different online resources to learn basic Python. Some people might argue, no, R is better, or I heard Julia was cool, but here's a survey from data scientists on Kaggle about what language they actually use, and Python is by far the top. R here is light blue and has just been on a steep decline. Java is actually a little incline, which is interesting. SQL is technically a programming language, but it's going to be way harder to do some things in Python than they are in SQL. SQL is more so used for data warehousing and data storage. I'll talk about that. Okay. Scrolling down past that, you can use these resources to learn basic Python. It's going to be really helpful if you're with someone who actually knows Python because you're going to be, I don't know, coding and then you're stuck on a bug and you can't figure it out for the past two hours. What do you do? you can ask somebody and they're going to look at your code and in two seconds know exactly what's wrong with it. Another thing you can do is use ChatGPT as a beginner and say, my code doesn't run. How can I make it run? And it's pretty good, at least with the beginner code. Once you get into more complicated things, then all of a sudden it can start making stuff up. But if you're doing like for loops, while loops, different like basic pandas, ChatGPT is also going to be your peer mentor. Interactive computing, this is kind of a subset of Python, but as data scientists, there's this thing called interactive computing that allows us to iter iteratively work through code in a really nice fashion to allow us to check all these different routes, and we don't have to make a giant program that runs and takes forever. Data structures, so this is a bit more general than Python. You need to know some Python or some other language to start working with data structures, but this tells us how we can organize our data and then manipulate our data. There are different things that you need to take, take into consideration. Like if you have a list of numbers, do you like pulling from the beginning of the list or from the end of the list more? That's going to change what data structure you prefer to use for your efficiency of your program. And we're on the SQL and database management section. This is going to be a quick one to learn. Typically, if you already know Python, SQL comes pretty quick. Um, I've heard it SQL, I've heard it SQL, it's just like the community you're in 
really depends. But you can pick up SQL in like a 30-minute course and you start to understand it. You're going to maybe run into a data set you want to use that's in a format you don't know. That's a good excuse to learn how to use that format. This is how I learn most of my things. Like I have a project I want to do and I run into a roadblock where I need to learn something that I don't know. So I learn that thing and then get past that roadblock block in my project. Um, that's how I learned basic SQL because I had a SQL database that I needed to use. Here's some Coursera and then Python for everybody, Coursera. If you go to the Coursera, oops, looks like I gotta fix that link. I'm gonna try to fix that link right now. Okay, so if you go to the Coursera page, you can click enroll for free or you can pay to actually like take the course. But if you enroll for free, it's just like you're auditing. You don't get the certificate and you don't get graded on things, but it's entirely free. You get all the material. Okay, I just paused and fixed all the Coursera links. There are actually quite a few that were messed up, but yeah, this should work now. Okay. So after you've learned these things, you can also learn version control. This is going to be especially important if you're working with other people because version control allows you all to work in your own little bubbles and then be adding different things to the main code track. You can branch off, mess around, come back without messing with somebody else's code. Next, algorithms. Algorithms is how you think through different problems. Is there a better way to sort something? Is there a better way to search through something? You're trying to optimize the space you use and also the time that it takes to run things. And algorithms is, are going to present different ways to do these optimizations. One way to get good at these is do lots of problems on leet code or hacker rank. You could also take an algorithms course. There are so many free algorithm courses online. Um, I would suggest the leet code hacker rank and just grinding on problems. Because one thing, if you're also looking for a job, you can show them that you have a good leet code score or hacker rank score, and employers really like that. Moving on to data engineering, the first part in the data pipeline. Data engineers take data in whatever form and make it into a way that can go into production or go into the next part of the pipeline to analytics or machine learning engineers, collecting, storing, and processing large amounts of data. To be this person, you need to be good at data storage systems. So here's a databases course that you can take, and also data warehousing. So things like Postgres or cloud warehousing solutions like these three. Um, I don't know which one's best. People have different preferences between Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. So I would suggest Googling a bit more and then picking one that fits with you. Because they each have their little quirks, but kind of lock you into a different pipeline. And it's also good to know data processing frameworks like Pandas, PySpark, and Dask. Pandas, Pandas is amazing. Some people don't like it and complain about it, but it's really the best that we have where you can import things like a CSV spreadsheet and in Python do all the things that you would normally be able to do with Microsoft Excel. You can manipulate things with rows and columns, apply things to all rows, just get certain values that are within a column, things like that. Um, but then Dask and Spark allow you to parallelize processes. What that means is, uh, so on the computer, if you click play on a Python program, in, it's going to go into the computer and run on a single thread. But if you parallelize something, that means it runs on a bunch of threads. So say I have to do like a million multiplications, but none of their answers rely on each other. I could parallelize that by putting it on a bunch of threads and like 10xing my speed or if I'm running it unparalyzing with a GPU, I can 1,000x the speed. Um, and PySpark and Dask are frameworks that allow you to split the jobs and make your code more efficient. Data analytics, the second track that you can take and specialize in. Data analytics, you're telling the story behind the data. You uncover the story, you learn about the story, and then you communicate the story. So exploratory data analysis is how you find the story. You summarize the main characteristics, you find patterns or different traits in your data set, and then you have to go on to communicate those things. So you're gonna do that with data visualization, you're gonna make graphs, you're gonna make dashboards, something like that, 
so that non-technical people, the stakeholders, are able to understand these, complica these complicated solutions and findings that you've made. Also hypothesis testing. So if I'm making a conclusion similar to the stats and probability comments I was making earlier, if I'm saying these things are correlated, I can't just know that from looking. You can actually say that with confidence, like there's a definition of correlation out there. There's a definition of causality, actually lots of definitions. Um, so this section is where you become confident about the conclusions you make. You can say this is fact which helps a lot when you're communicating to a non-technical person if there's not doubt in your voice. The third track, machine learning. So it's just a tool to learn from data, make predictions or decisions based on information that it might not have seen before. Step one, step one is get good at the math, linear algebra and calculus, and then move forward with your basic Python into the machine learning algorithms. This isn't deep learning, this isn't neural networks, those come next. This is, these are things like linear regression, principal component ana analysis, SVM, the basics, like the bread and butter of machine learning. You have to know the basics before you move on to the more complicated things because it gives you a good lens with which to do the complicated things. Sometimes the complicated things are not the best tool for the job, you should really be using a simple thing. And if you don't know the simple things, then you're just going to over-engineer all of your work. Okay, neural networks. Um, I learned these using these two resources, actually. This is how I learned neural networks and deep learning. It's the same two resources, just different parts of both of them. You can pick and choose, like find what works for you. But neural networks and deep learning are, are extending these insights from machine learning. Like you just, it's on steroids with what it's capable of. Um, kind of the most complicated thing that we're working with right now are transformer models. It fits in the deep learning category. This is what ChatGPT, BERT, BARD, all these special things are built on. Um, and say you've mastered all that. Say you've like, gotten through one of these different tracks, one of these. This is a huge image. Uh, okay, here we go. One of these three tracks, one of the in, in section two, or all three, depending. Then we move on to deployment. And how do you deploy stuff? You can deploy stuff with Docker. Docker is a cool tool. If you started working with Python already, you may have gotten into trouble with your Python version or Python environment or, I don't know, packages that you've installed. Docker takes care of all of that, where in one Docker container, you can put a Python version, you can put an environment, you can put packages. So I can say, here's my project, here's everything it needs, and then hand that to somebody and you've dockerized it. And then they can take that thing and run it perfectly just as you intended. And Kubernetes is a way to manage all these different containerized applications at a like enterprise level. How do you distribute your work? How do you add the machine learning model to your shopping cart or something like that? Um, it's gonna be super specific depending on what you're involved in. Ideally, there's someone who you can ask questions to, but otherwise just read up on all these different strategies and start experimenting with what works for you because we're all just making it up to some extent. Otherwise, to deploy, you can use web development to deploy different things that you've had. So if I am creating an internal website to monitor the health of my company, I can create a website with web development. It starts out HTML, CSS, JavaScript. This is where all web developers start. My entire samwesby.com website is just built with these three things, but you can get more complicated. Say you use REST APIs to access different servers and databases. This ties back to the cloud databases section that I talked about. Or you can create some like interesting things with backend frameworks. Say you want to be more complicated than just this static website I have running. You want something dynamic and something, I don't know, a little above and beyond. Above and beyond. Then you can learn a backend framework. Web dev is a deep rabbit hole, so just be warned. Like, Dip your toe in, see if you actually need it. Otherwise, you could end up spending years just being a web developer. And finally, real world projects, the true test. If you can succeed in a real world project, then I think that makes you a real data scientist. How do you find these real world projects? The one I don't have listed here is get a job as a data scientist, but otherwise for skill learning purposes, you can find um, nonprofit organizations 
or maybe like your mom's friend has somebody who you can help out or your cousin has an idea for a thing to do. If you tell people machine learning, typically like they'll jump on that and say some crazy stuff that maybe will give you um, a real project to work on. One thing to be careful of when you're working on real projects like this is don't oversell yourself and become a burden to the organization. You're trying to learn here. Like I learned everything through projects. It's really hard for me to learn just with a straight course. So you have to oversell yourself a little bit, but the more you oversell yourself, the more time you need to learn the things that you say you already know or to learn the things that somebody expects you to know. And that's completely okay. Just be transparent about the timeline. Also be transparent about your abilities and your expectations with the project. Because sometimes these organizations are relying on you and putting time into you and money into you, even if they're not paying you directly, but as volunteer services, they're paying employees to meet with you and work with you. So you don't want to waste their time. Just make sure you deliver and you have the ability to at least learn how to deliver what you say you're going to deliver. Contributing to open source projects, that's a big one. A lot of people do that. Um, and then data science hackathons and competitions. I remember a lot of hackathons that I did when I was in undergrad where we would, after like 12 hours, we would get to a point where nobody knew how to do the thing we wanted to. So it's just like somebody said, yep, I'll learn that. And then they spent the next four hours learning how to do the thing that they wanted to do. And then they came away. They knew how to do this thing. They had practical experience doing it. And they usually like keep it with them, keep those skills with them for a long time. If you're an undergrad, it's going to be easy to find hackathons. I don't really know how to find hackathons out of undergrad. I'm in grad school, so hackathons are easier to find. But I'm sure there are at least online hackathons that anybody can join. I have a whole lot of other projects that you can do here. So a little bit of recap. That's the whole route. You really have everything you need in this roadmap. It's just the time and also the energy required to go from start to expert. I think you can do it. If you've maintained attention for this whole video, you have at least enough attention to watch another video, a lot shorter video, a tutorial for Python to get started, get your toe wet. I have a link to my Python series in the description below. It's for beginners. It's for Python. I'm working on it. Um, and it'll get you from here to at least here, which in my book, that's called progress. Be sure to leave a question if I got you any questions at any point. Like the video if it was helpful and also leave a comment if you have any other videos that you'd like me to make. If that's it, then happy coding.